Yeah, thank you for tuning in to Seismic Radio. And we are looking at uh, a little neglected letter in the Bible, 2 Corinthians. A couple of interesting verses in there, but uh, certainly not uh, one of the preacher's favorite to preach from on a Sunday morning. Uh, anyway, we're just going to go through the, the letter verse by verse, and um, we are just uh, hopefully tackling the... Um, the second chapter in the next uh, half hour, in the next 30 minutes. So that's the plan, stick to about 30 minutes. Okay, um, big question is, you know, we've got plans for our lives and uh, we set off on one. And I remember when I was a young Christian, I was telling everybody this and this is what I believe God wants me to do. And this is, this is the way I'm going to go. And life turned a very different direction and it, uh, it looked very stupid afterwards. So, so sometimes it's better not to boast about the future. It's okay to, to head in a certain direction, even if it turns out not to be the right one. But we always have to bear in mind that, that um, God's economy is very different to the world's economy. So sometimes God takes us a certain path. And um, <clears throat> and from a from a worldly perspective, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But from a divine p- p- perspective, it's just perfect. It's a perfect path for us, even though you know we look at it from our you know frog level perspective, and it just looks absolutely crazy what we are doing. And yet, God, from His divine perspective, has organized it all in perfect imperfection. Okay, so Paul makes some plans and he changes his plans. So what's what's wrong with this holy man? You know, is he not in touch with God? Does he does he get confused? Is he taking things lightly? Lightly, you know, just uh, dithering from here to there and all over the place. Um, obviously not. Yeah, we know that, and um, it's a re- rhetorical question, but um, a rhetorical question. But but nevertheless, you know, this is uh, some some something Paul recognizes here. When you read through the letter, uh, it looks a lot like Paul is justifying his position, and bearing in mind he was pretty <clears throat> serious and severe in the first letter with the Corinthians. Um, <clears throat> so he. Um, he is uh, laying into them quite a bit, and, and so maybe they are not uh, too happy about Paul. And they think, you know, who does, does this guy think he is? And then look at him, you know. He says he's going to come, and then he doesn't come after all. So maybe there might be something like this going on. Anyway, let's go through uh, what Paul says. We, we're going to start off with um, a, one of those mega long sentences Paul is uh, very fond of. And it says here, For our rejoicing is this. <clears throat> the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, we, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conduct in the world a more abundantly toward you. <clears throat> and you read this and you think, what is he saying? Uh, by, by the time you come to abundantly toward you, you wonder what abundantly, what is it all about? Because the sentence is so long. Anyway, let's let's sort of dig down in this. Yeah. So he says, number one is, uh, we are happy. Yeah. And because our conscience is clear, the testimony of our conscience, so our conscience is clear, and <clears throat> we stand before God in simplicity and godly sincerity. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Clear conscience, you know, simple and godly and sincere. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, not with fleshly wis- wisdom, not with carnal, with worldly wisdom, but by the grace of God. So quite a difference. So we, we operate not by fleshly wisdom, even though it might look to you, you know, that we've been operating like fleshly wisdom here because we said we were going to come and we were going to come, you know, on our way to Macedonia and on the way back to Macedonia, but we didn't come in the end. So they might think, what's going on here? You know, why didn't he come? Um, <clears throat> and um, and he, he makes a point. Look, it's not fleshly wisdom. It's, this is how we work. This is how we operate. We operate by the grace of God. Uh, and we, we are in simplicity and, and godly sincerity before God. <clears throat> We have had our conduct in the world more abundantly toward you. So this is about the way they were dealing, you know, moving through the world. The problem is we are still in the world, even though we are not of the world. And, and Paul makes a point here <clears throat> that, um, that, yeah, th- their conduct in the world has been like this, but they've got a clear conscience. And, um, and also towards them, they've got a clear conscience as well, towards the Corinthians. And then he goes in, you know, what was happening and <clears throat> where this is coming from. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it would sound like in Greek, um, whether the way the sentence is structured would be more, um, you know, a little, little bit easier to follow than what it is in, in English or German. You know, uh, we can toggle between 
different translations. Let's have a look at Darby, see what Darby says to this. It says here, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and sincerity before God, not in fleshly wisdom, but in God's grace, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly towards you. Okay. Obviously, it's, it's saying the same thing. It's maybe a little bit easier formulated. That's by uh, Darby. Uh, when was he around? I think it was the 17th, 1800s. Uh, Darby, evangelical theologian. Uh, okay, let's go back to the MKJV. That's the one I tend to use. Um, <clears throat> I love the King James Version. Um, obviously, it's, the English is sometimes a bit antiquated, a bit old. Uh, the reason is that the King James Version was using a text which I believe is more accurate than some of the later texts, where some of the, the so-called heretical texts or latter texts were sort of being moved into. Um, but again, the differences which are there are just minimal, absolutely minimal. Okay, so modern King James Version obviously is still, the English is modernized a little bit and put into a modern context, but is still uh, based on the same texts. Okay, for we <coughs> write no other things to you than, uh, what we, than what you read or recognize. I trust you shall recognize them even to the end, even as you have recognized us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Again, mega long sentence. I should count the words. I mean, I've heard the theory, I mentioned this before, that if you've got more a sentence with more than 19 letters, uh, 19 words, sorry, sentence with more than 19 words, by the time you get to the last word, you've pretty much forgotten what, uh, what the sentence started off with. And um, <clears throat> so if you, for example, if you write a letter, always bear this in mind, keep it simple, keep it straightforward, keep it to the point. And Paul is loading a lot of stuff in here. And But again, we've got time, we can go through this and we can see try and figure out what he tried to say in the first context and also how it applies to us today. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, what Paul is saying is, look, we are, we are writing the same stuff to you, you know, so you should recognize and realize, you know, what we are writing to you. Um, <clears throat> even, you know, right to the end, even, you know, as time goes on. And, and he writes this for a reason as well, and you can get this from the context of the letter. They, there were other people who turned up and they were... In the German translation, they are described as the super apostles. So they are, they were like guys who were right at the top, and and they uh, probably told told the Corinthians, you know, forget about Paul, you know, he sees nothing. You know, look at us, we we are we are the the bee's knees, and um, we will tell you the way. And that's uh, that's what Paul may be saying here, even as he recognized us in part. So they partly recognized Paul, though there was something there between the Corinthians and Paul, and. And they recognize what he's done and they recognize his, his position. But, but still, there's this element of the, the other guys who came in and who started to, um, you know, to have an influence on the Corinthians. And the influence was not necessarily a good one from judging from this letter here. Um, and Paul says that they are rejoicing and they, that, that uh, they should also um, um, <clears throat> That we are rejoicing, yeah, and and as you know, they are Paul's in the day of the Lord. So obviously, Paul has preached the gospel. They came to faith on account of what Paul did, and and he started working with them, and they sort of went on their own little wayward ways. And, and we can see this in First Corinthians that the the church was one of the more trouble troublesome churches, where everything went wrong. Yeah, everything, pretty much everything went wrong. Just to remind you, I mean, when you look at the Corinthians, they were they were having court cases amongst them, themselves. You can take this from the First Corinthians. They were they were having issues with sexual immorality, and Paul says that the immorality amongst you is even worse than among the the pagans, you know, the Gentiles. Uh, they um, their church services were in a mess. They were all over the place. You know, there was no respect to anything. There was no order to it. It was just disorder. When they got together, they all got a bit crazy. Uh, they, they thought they were very spiritual, but they went over the top, and a lot of things fell by the wayside, you know, in their conduct. Um, people sometimes just hang out at church, and they didn't recognize that it was a church, but it was just to, to eat themselves, yeah, to, to uh, you know, just hang out, eat, drink, be happy, and not realizing that, that really what they were supposed to be doing this was they were supposed to gather as a body of Christ, as a church, they're supposed to worship God. They're supposed to encourage one another. They're supposed to 
help one another. But but again, what we have to understand is we, we are probably dealing with a church that wasn't Jewish predominantly, but it was predominantly pagan. So there were a lot of pagans who came to Christ, and they were used to going to the temple service. And if you you know fancied some meat, it's a bit like uh, um, I don't know McDonald's or something. You you went to the temple, and some meat was sacrificed to the gods, and you bought some of it and you ate it. Yeah. And uh, you probably had a meal out at the temple. You know, if you wanted to hang out, you just went to the temple. Maybe a bit like a pub today or, or something something like that. Um, and it wasn't like a great deal, a big deal. It was just sort of the way society was organized. And then the church comes along, and this is all very different. And people just say, oh, instead of going to the temple, I go to the church and eat something there. And they didn't recognize uh, the Lord's body and, and uh, you know, the Last Supper and the, the memorial to, you know, Jesus died for our sins. And, um, and we are waiting for his return you know, until he comes back. And that's, that's how long we're going to celebrate the the lord's supper and and they they weren't recognizing this but they were sort of going a little bit uh crazy in in all of this and again this letter has to be understood in this context that paul is not writing to this you know top-notch church where everything is going really well but he's writing to a church that have got serious problems really really serious problems where, where the basics are not right um and and he's trying to to sort them out, and and obviously Paul is upset because he's told him the way to go, and then by the looks of it, and this is what we find in this letter, some other people came in and they messed them all up, and um, and it can be quite annoying, you know, when you put your heart and soul into something, and then it's all for nothing. Yeah. Again, this is what Paul says here. Uh, okay, we, we carry on, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before so that you might have a second benefit. So Paul wanted to come to to them again, to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia to you. So he was going into Macedonia, and Corinth obviously is in Greece. So um, when he goes in and when he comes out, he just wanted to pop in with the Corinthians and stay with them sometime and and try to sort them out. Uh, To be brought on my way towards Judea by you. And he obviously wanted to go to Judea, and he wanted to... And we can read this in Acts, and eventually obviously went to Judea. And... uh, and uh, it was a very emotional scene because people didn't want him to go. They wanted, wanted him to stay. And they knew that he was going to be bound and that sort of prophecies and stuff like that. But Paul felt moved by the Spirit, I assume, to, to make his way to Jerusalem. Okay, anyway, then purposing this, so then, you know, this is what says in Tenen. Uh, did, did I indeed use lightness? Yeah, okay, what a, what a sentence. Purposing this, did I indeed use lightness? Um, could use a lot better English words as well to try and describe this. And he wanted to do this stuff. Then wanting to do this stuff, did I do it lightly? That might be a modern translation of this. Or the things that I purpose or the things that I want to do, do I want to do them according to the flesh so that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. Uh, So is this the way he operates, you know, that he just, oh, yeah, we're going to do this and that, and he's a very flighty person. So Paul is basically asking the question, do you think I'm a flighty person? Uh, Do I make decisions according to the flesh or by the spirit or... Well, why, you know, why is this what I decided to do? And I didn't do it in the end. Uh, this is a question Paul is really asking here. And maybe the Corinthians were upset about this, and maybe those other false teachers who came in there, they gave him a hard time and uh, told him, you know, look at this Paul guy, you know, he doesn't even turn up, he doesn't care about you, but we are here and we are sorting you out. That's maybe what was the message there. And, and Paul is trying to deal with this in this letter. And then he says, but as God is true, our word towards you was not yes and no. Okay, so it's a little bit of a Greek rhetoric I can taste here a little bit. And then he says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Okay, so here yeah, back to the point. Jesus Christ is yes. He's a big yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us. But he confirming us, anointing us with you in Christ is God. And he, he makes a point, you know, all the promises are fulfilled in, in, in Christ. All the promises towards us. And, um, and obviously the Bible is full of promises, you know, of blessings and, and all sorts of stuff, of good things God is going to give to us, and in Christ they are yes. And again, it may not appear um, where you are at the moment in time. Uh, but again, you have to look at it from an eternal perspective. Your existence is not, um, you know, however many years ago, starting with the birth 
of yourself and then your time goes off and one day you're going to die. I mean, Jesus said that whosoever believes in him will not die. He will not see death, but he is crossed over from death to life. So you are alive and your life is going to continue. You will not taste death as a, a godless person will taste death. But you will go over from death into life, into eternity. But he confirming us and anointing us with you is Christ in God. Okay. Interesting phrases as well. We've got a confirmation and an anointing as well. Anointing is a bit like a like a um a contract, like a, a blessing. We we've got I think a little bit of a um a misuse of the term. Where anointing means that you've got some special spiritual gift and that is there. And it may be the case, but um um, but an anointing is more like an appointment. Kings were anointed into office. And um, I think even the Catholics use it for their priestly thing, or when you get confirmed, they put some oil on your forehead, and, and that is there. When we pray for the sick, we anoint them with oil. Um, there are sort of certain connotations in this word which we are not using correctly because within you know evangelical Christianity there are certain groups who have picked up on this and um, um, they make people to endeavor for anointings meaning manifestations of the spirit and in their craving for manifestations maybe some sometimes it is not really um, you know what God wants for them uh, and, and, and again, what we should be crave for is the will of God in our lives. And this could be, you know, a spiritual gifting. It could be something. And, and God will place this in your heart and we should yearn for it and, you know, receive this gifting from God. But it may not be what you want it to be. It may be something else. Yeah. Uh, an appointment, huh? I mentioned in a previous talk about, you know, the preacher at the front of the church and maybe the old lady, old bloke, maybe young lady, young bloke who uh, cleans the toilet in the church and is really conscientious about making sure that the toilet is clean, that the soap is clean, that everything is uh, perfect, uh, that the heater is turned on and the people, you know, if they need to go to the special place, that everything is perfect. And I mentioned that, that that person might receive a bigger reward than the, the preacher at the pulpit. And, uh, and maybe that is the anointing of this person. Uh, and again, God's economy is very different to the economy we believe in or we you know, get pretty much taught or told, told to, to believe in all our lives yeah, in, through the media and through everything, where a certain set of values is sort of impressed on us, but, but God's economy is different. And there might be the anointing of, you know, taking care of the lesser things in life, but needlessly, you know, needless to say, as important as, uh, you know, the, thing, the things which are more prominent, the prominent or eminent things in life. And, uh, and so, again, the point I'm trying to make here is uh, when, when I look at this, um, you will have confirmation in your life, you will have anointing in your life as well. And it may not what you expect it to be. It may not be the glamour kind of stuff, the glamorous appearance, but it may just be uh, uh, a very menial stuff God is asking you to do. And, and what I want you to do is just embrace it with all your heart. If you feel or if you can see in your spirit that this is from God, you know, pick it up and do it well. And, and try to do it as good as you can. Um, that, that is very important, I think. Rather than, you know, trying to aspire for something which is not meant for you at this time, at this point in your life. And then it get, carries on, he has sealed us and having given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Okay. Hmm. It's almost cryptic when you read those, those. I think very often this is the first chapter and you just, okay, you know, this is what he's saying. He's just setting the, the stage and, and you just read through it and a lot of the stuff you, um, you go past it. But he has sealed us. And we get this expression later on as well. 
that we are sealed with this um, spirit uh, as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Yeah? So we are sealed. And again, what is a seal? A seal is a mark of ownership. Uh, in the olden days when you had a letter, the letter was closed, then, um, for example, the king or the person would have a ring, and this lasted a long time, so they would take some wax, use this wax to close a letter, and then press a ring in it, and then based on the imprint of the ring, you could verify that this is actually from the person who sent it. And that was sort of uh, a method of authentication, but also if the seal is broken, the messenger was going to be in serious trouble. Uh, I don't know how, I mean, it would be interesting to know how often this happened when you, I mean, wa wax is quite brittle. When you have a messenger on a horse and you, you've got the thing in there that maybe eventually that seal was going to break and, and the re recipient got it, um, they wouldn't be happy about it, that's for sure. They wouldn't be happy about it. I wonder what uh, the messengers would do, whether they would try to reseal it or whatever. But uh, confirming us and anointing us with you in Christ is God. He has sealed us and having given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Yeah. So anyway, there, there is this stuff that we are sealed by the Spirit of God. We've got this seal of ownership on us. And um, the earnest of the Spirit, yeah, the Spirit of God in our hearts and the, the serenity of it all. And then finally he says, and I call God as witness to my soul, in order to spare you, I have not yet come to Corinth. Um, not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Okay, it's interesting what he says. So, so this is obvious. Paul was pretty mad about the Corinthians. And again, I, I challenge you to read the book of Acts. And it's, it's almost when you read between the lines, it's quite interesting what it um, what it says and how it des describes how the people were going away. And even though we've got the Spirit of God, and even though we've got all the great guys like Peter and Paul and, and, and James and, and um, um, Thomas and all the others, but when you, when you sort of pick up on some of the stories of, in church history or, you know, the church fathers or um, even just in the book of Acts, you can see that, that there were a lot of things where people were just being people and and they they messed up in a almost in a humorous way. And when you look at it with hindsight, it was quite funny. But uh, but they messed up, and they they were dead serious, and they had tensions and struggles and disagreements, and and uh, you know one needed to uh, you know tell off the other one and so on. And we got this all the way through. We got this all the way through in in church history. And it may, maybe it's something to bear in mind. We are still uh, human. We are still full of mistakes. We still have errors. We are dealing with people who are, uh, you know, making many mistakes in their lives. And, um, and, and I mean, when we look at John, I mean, John in his old age, he was just writing, you know, the key is just love. You know, you need to love one another. And if you love one another, you can overlook mistakes and you can... You know, you can have a bit of a chuckle when things go wrong and you look at it with hindsight and, and you made like a silly mistake somewhere. But, um, but you, need, you need to have love to, to get through it all. And, and there's a lot of wisdom in that. And the older I get as well, the, the more I realize that, that this is a quality we all need to, to strive for more than anything else. Yeah. Simple thing of loving one another as Christ has loved us. And I tell you, it's sometimes very difficult because we're not dealing with easy characters in and outside the church, in and outside of the kingdom of God. And it makes it sometimes very, very difficult. But uh, we, need, we really need the grace of God to, to turn us into loving people and to be able to forgive people who do wrong and who cause a lot of problems in our lives. Okay, but he confirming us and anointing us with you is Christ Jesus. We looked at this here, and then now I call God is my wisdom, my soul, in order to spare I have not yet come to Corinth. So this, we can see this right here. He, Paul is mad. He's mad with the Corinthians. And he wanted to spare them. And that's the reason why he hasn't come, because he was so angry with what was going on there. And it's interesting as well, because that sets the tone of the letter. And we can see after the letter of some of the additional stuff which was going on there in Corinth. So obviously they received the first letter, you know, trying to straighten them out. And they, by the looks of it, they've done this. Yeah? They've, um, they've um, tried to, you know, get right with God and take it on board, what Paul said. But also there were some other developments as well. And we can see this from this letter when we look between the lines of what was going on in, in Corinth. 
Uh, and then Paul makes a very good point as well, and, and this is, again, is good leadership as well. And not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Okay, Paul makes it very clear. So they are not some tyrants, you know, who can tell them what to do and what to feel and what to think. And that's sometimes how some churches are run. You've got leadership, which is um, very tyrannical. And, um, and if I can control the faith of a person, of what they believe, you know, as a spiritual leader, you can control the whole person. And, I mean, Karl Marx, he said something that uh, religion is the opiate of the people. And, uh, and I tend to agree with him. Um, religion is the opiate of the people, especially if it's not truth. Uh, people get deluded into some wrong something and they are not confronted with the truth. If you meet God and you open your heart to Jesus Christ, Jesus said of himself that he is the truth. And I mean, a, a, sec a secular person would say that I'm off my mind to say this, but I would say this is not religion. It's a relationship with God. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your religion is not based on fairy tales or fables, but it's based on the Word of God, which is the Bible. And the Bible gives witness of who Jesus was and what he did and the way of salvation. And it gives us uh, an insight into mankind, an insight into one nation which God chose to, to deal with amongst all the other nations. And, um, and then we've got the New Testament, where we've got like um, a very good description of what human nature is all about. And, and the issues, the troubles we have, and how we need to deal with this in our walk with God. And, and th again, that's very important, that sort of understanding what the New Testament is, you know, how important it is, and also not to yield ourselves to anyone who comes along and says, hey, I'm the guy, you know, I'm going to tell you which way you need to go. And this includes myself, so anything I say, you need to test it, you need to uh, put it on the, on, under, the, under scrutiny, and yeah, put it in prayer before God, especially if it changes um, the way you think or the way your life goes. Yeah, um, And that is your responsibility. You need to bring it and wait before God. I don't get everything right, and I, I'm, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that I, I make mistakes. I make mistakes in my understanding of the Bible. I make mistakes in my everyday life. And uh, I, t I tell you one thing as well, the, the times where I thought spiritually I was the strongest were the times where I had my biggest failures in my, in my walk with God. It's, it's, it's strange. It's really, really strange, but it's, it's just, just the way it worked. The time where I thought I'm really, I'm really struggling, you know, uh, my life is just a mess. I, I, I'm not walking the way God wants me to walk, and I know this, and I need to, you know, to straighten myself out and, 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 and get right with God. There were the times where probably... You know, from a divine perspective, I was strongest. When I'm weak and God is strong, that's that's the best time. When I think I'm strong, that's pretty much the time where <clears throat> where the ditch is right in front of me and I just fall right into it. And I don't know, maybe you've got a similar experience. Maybe not, but um, I've been sort of walking with Christ for 30 odd years, 34, 30, 38, I think. So quite a long time ago, quite a long time ago. And then what Paul says, and he makes a point, and this is like if you are a leader within a spiritual context, yeah, like a, a, a church elder, a pastor, a preacher, a missionary, um, you should never have dominion over somebody's faith. You should leave this to God. God should have dominion over their faith. All we are is just help us of your joy. We should be helping people in their, in their walk with God, but we shouldn't rule over them. That's not our job. That's, that's not what we are here for. We are just signposts to say, go this way. This is a way to Jesus Christ. This is a way to a good son and healthy relationship with God. Look at your life, you know, check it out. I think there might be something wrong, but, but you check it out and you bring it before God. Um, and then he says, for by faith you stand. And I think we just manage about the half hour <laughs> to the timeline here. At the end, for by faith you stand. And this is the key as well. In our life, so it's not about um, it's not about um, who we are, what we are, what we do, uh, our title. You know, whether we've got a fancy title, apostle, bishop, um, prophet, whatever. Yeah. No, this doesn't make us stand. It's not even a membership of anything that makes us stand. It's it's not our our donation record or anything like that. It's our faith, our faith 
that makes us stand. And faith is very important. It is a trust into something we cannot see. It is a relationship. It is a, um, you know, the term faithfulness to <clears throat> to be loyal. It's to do with loyalty. There are all these notions which are packed into this word faith. And, um, and by faith we stand. So faith is the most important thing you have. Nobody can take it away from you. Once you've got faith in Jesus Christ and and it's been worked inside of you through the Holy Spirit, it is the biggest treasure you have in your life. They can steal everything what you have of you. They can destroy your life, they can destroy your body, but they cannot destroy your faith. And people try. <laughs> and Paul talks about this as well. You get like false teachers who come in there and they try to mess about with your faith. And and again, <clears throat> um, Matthew says something very encouraging. And it talks about deceivers. <coughs> it's a Matthew 24, the end time speech. And, and we, we certainly see more um, people who are, who are out to wreck your faith. But, um, but Jesus is talking about the elect. And, <coughs> and he says they would even deceive the elect if it were possible. There's, um, <coughs> I believe there's something where we can be led off the straight and narrow path through shysters, through deceivers, through false pre preachers, false prophets. <clears throat> but um, but we'll always be pulled back in. As soon as we turn our eyes to Jesus, to the shepherd, he will lead us back to where we ought to be. And it's very, very important. So if you get you know moved and tossed about by various doctrines and strange, strange teachings and strange things which are going on, cast your eyes on Jesus. You know, go back to Jesus and he will, he will pull you back on the straight and narrow. I've got tons of stories, and we, we are running out of time. I would tell you a story from uh, church history of uh, one of the disciples, uh, Johnette, or it was a, a disciple, yeah, one of the disciples, Johnette, who turned into a, a really, you know, one of the most ferocious robbers and highwaymen at its time. But um, <clears throat> um, just a long sh story short, when... Um, he entrusted, you know, this guy into the care of one of his um, his bishops, and and the bishop failed, and the guy, you know, went off the rails, and he was one of the worst people around there, really evil. So John let himself be captured, and he insisted to see their leader. I mean, when he saw the leader, the guy just melted down, and he repented, and he came back. You know, he came back to Christ. And there's something inside of us which will always yearn to God, and will always be ready for correction. And I tell you one thing, it's just going to be a lot easier if you do it. You know, if you move away from the straight and narrow, you know, go back as soon as you can. It's a lot easier to do it earlier than later because it just gets worse and worse and worse. We need to get back. Okay, I'm going to leave it at this. Um, we're going to carry on with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in the next talk. Uh, God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio.